Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending uh, our new Hug event. This one is all about post-production. So we're going to be talking about editing platforms. We're going to be talking about hosting platforms, as well as measuring success of our videos. This is our fourth and final Hug of the year. So if you're unfamiliar with these formats, what we do is we basically go over an hour-long presentation covering anything video related. And we do these once a quarter. So uh, we try to structure it in a sense of coming into it, coming up with why video, right? Statistics of why people are getting more into video and different video concepts you can come up with. And then in Q2, we went over everything video pre-production, you know, creating your outline, uh, all the initial questions you should be asking your client, things like that. And then Q3, we moved into production. So everything you should be doing while on set, while recording, directly after recording, so on and so forth. And then this is the wrap up presentation here in Q4. We're going to go over post production, right? So everything you should be doing in editing and then where you're going to upload your videos and how to measure that success, right? So really, it's just going through the entire journey of video from start to finish. So I've said this a couple of times. If you guys have any questions, you know, let us know in the chat about that. And if it pertains to the, what we're talking about, that slide, we'll go ahead and answer it right then. Of course, if it's unrelated, we'll just wait till the end and conduct a Q&A there as well. Um, so let's go ahead and move this forward. Let us know who you are in the chat. So, you know, your name, your company, what you do. Um, and that'll give us an idea of, you know, who we're speaking to in the general audience. And of course, if you guys do have more questions, um, we'll do a quick introduction here. My name is Aaron Oberdick. I'm the video marketing manager at Nexity Marketing. So my job responsibilities are basically um, creating all videos for all of our clients, as well as internal work. Of course, we do these educational workshops through HubSpot as well. So that is also my, my primary uh, job. Uh, Corey, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, my name is Corey Christian. I am the multimedia marketer here at Nextiny. Uh, and what that means is basically I assist Aaron in all things video, but then I also lend my hands wherever I can with just kind of graphics and creative assets and, you know, any anywhere I can kind of help out. Awesome. And I see Diane's asking where we are located. We are in sunny Sarasota, Florida. So um, if you were wondering, we did have that hurricane just come through a couple of weeks ago. So we're all, uh, you know, recovering in that aspect. Corey and I got lucky and we really didn't have to deal with anything there. But um, Diane, you're located in Sarasota too. Hopefully you stayed safe and uh, everything's good on your end as well. So, all right. So we'll go ahead and just roll along here. First thing I want to talk about is the HubSpot Video Marketing Study Group. So if you guys are unfamiliar with this, this is basically a forum board hosted by HubSpot where we're talking about anything video related. So um, we host boot camps and people are joining from those boot camps. We're having discussions there about video concepts, what kind of gear should people be getting, and just any other questions you may have anything video related, right? Maybe it's on the pre-production stuff and how you can implement uh, your, your CRM to your uh, hosting platform, whatever it may be, right? Just you can ask questions here and you will get answers. We have over a thousand members now, so it is very much a growing community. And Corey and I are always popping in there and answering people's questions as well. So definitely join the HubSpot Marketing Study Group if you haven't already. And then I also just mentioned the boot camp. A lot of people from boot camp are joining this group. And what the boot camp is, is really just a more honed in experience for learning how to implement video into your marketing strategy. So these are six week courses where Corey and I will educate you on a weekly basis on a little bit of two things, right? The first thing is going to be creating weekly videos. So you, first off, you get comfortable on camera. And second off, you learn how to record and edit videos on that weekly basis. And then on the other side, we're going to teach you kind of that whole process, right? Pre-production, production, post-production. We're going to walk you through everything we do on our side at Nextiny, how we walk through the initial questions with a client and start to create that outline and pre-production, really hone in on what we need to achieve while we're recording. Then we take that document, we take all our equipment, we go out on set, we record everything, we make sure we're doing it the correct way. We teach you how we go through that process. And then of course, follow up with post-production. We, we walk you through how we go through the editing phase and how we implement branding and music and the whole nine yards into our video to really create that nice finalized video, right? So the bootcamp is really great if you are looking to really learn how to start creating video. You know, this is more of an entry level bootcamp. Um, 
If you are in video production, of course, you're more than welcome to sign up for this. Uh, we might cover a lot of topics that you may already know. But again, if you're just trying to figure out how can I get video started and implemented into my marketing strategies and services, this is a great opportunity for you to sign up. And it's also free. We do want to make sure that you understand that. Um, and there will be weekly assignments. We also want to make sure we say that because we do have a lot of people, of course, join and then, you know, we understand everyone has a job. And so you might not be able to complete those assignments. So we do see a little bit of drop off throughout the course of it. Um, but if this sounds anything interested at all, Corey, of course, just drop the link in the chat there. Definitely go check out our next boot camp. It's going to be in Q1 in 2023. So definitely register for that and come and hang out for six weeks with us. All right, so video hug agenda, what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, first thing's gonna be just a question of the day. We like to cover this. Um, some video editing platforms, right? So we're gonna talk about kind of that entry level platforms you can start utilizing today to edit videos, very simplistic formats, all the way to very high end level formats. Um, then we're gonna cover just some basic stuff, some branding, color correction, color grading, things you can do on an advanced scenario in editing, things you don't necessarily have to do, but things you should really should just be thinking about while editing. Then we're gonna talk a lot about video hosting, right? What video hosting platform is correct for you? What benefits certain uh, hosting platforms have versus others? Then we're gonna jump into some analytics, just uh, covering basically like top five or six analytics that we really look at at Nextiny and try to understand how we can better our videos. And then last, we'll go over the tools to measure the success of the video. So we're going to talk about Wistia, we're going to talk about Databox, and a few others really to just show how we create our entire reports uh, of our analysis in the videos. All right, so jumping into the very first thing here, question of the day. I have a, I have a question for you guys, so let, let us know in the chat here. What does it mean to fix it in post? Let us know in the chat, Payne. I'm going to give just a few seconds here and see if anyone wants to let us know. What does it mean to fix it in post? I like this little, re this smiley reaction here, the shocked face on your question, Corey. Here we go, we got Matt, Matt chiming in here. Worry about the problems during production and fix it in editing, color correction, mistakes on camera, et cetera. Yes, edit something after the shoot, that is correct, yeah. so. Exactly right. And we have a bunch of, of really funny memes here. Um, really fix it in post is basically just take the footage and we we had some problems in production. We had some issues recording, you know, a car drove by that made a real loud sound and we're not gonna re-record it because we've already gone through all the effort. So just fix it in post, right? Fix it in post. And that is definitely not the outlook we want because that will drive your editor insane or yourself insane if you are editing your own video, right? And your budget through the roof because there, everything gets amplified the more mistakes you have to start to correct, right? Like it becomes expensive to rotoscope out somebody's mustache from a feature film. Yeah, absolutely. And you, and you can see there, like judging off the memes, um, my favorite one is the Superman one because uh, just a fun story is Henry Cavill, when he was shooting Superman, he was simultaneously recording a, another movie at the time where he had this big thick mustache and it was required he needed it. Of course, we all know Superman doesn't have that big thick mustache, so they had to CGI out his mustache in every single shot throughout the movie. So if you go back and watch that movie and really focus on his upper lip, you will see hair just kind of po poking out every once in a while. So. Uh, you know, fix it in post is by far the worst outlook when it comes to video production. So definitely understand that post production does not mean magic, right? Always plan, always prepare, always practice and use those best practices so the editors can then have fun. They don't have to worry about fixing all of the issues happening going on. All right. So video post production, we're going to just generalize and talk about post production in a whole nutshell. I'm going to say this 5,000 times, but again, if you do guys have questions, let us know in that chat and we'll go ahead and answer that. And the first thing we're going to talk about is video post-production editing platforms, right? So, so many people go, great. Yeah, I, I've recorded this video. How do I edit it? And the first off, you need the right application to be able to edit that video. 
There are so many different video editing platforms out in the world right now. So we tried to hone in and kind of talk about the ones that we've utilized kind of at that entry level, that surface level knowledge that you need to know, and then working our way up to a more professional level editor with all the bells and whistles. So we're going to start at the top here, Descript. This is a program that we actually use in the bootcamp. It's a completely free program. Uh, it will leave a watermark in certain scenarios, of course. So um, just know that it's not completely free. They do have a paid option, but it is, an, it is a great uh, platform to utilize because if you're not familiar with editing video, they give a really, uh, just a really digestible way to edit video. They transcribe your entire video, right? So if you have someone speaking, when you up import the video into Descript Editor, it automatically transcribes the text and you edit via almost like a Google Doc. So let's say someone's speaking and they mess up a certain part, you can actually highlight that sentence that they messed up, delete it, and it'll cut the video to the way you're editing that document. So this is a really good editor for people just getting into video editing and they say, I really wanna learn how to edit video, but I don't, you know, I look at these platforms and they have all these lines and things and I just, it doesn't translate. Descript is the perfect platform to implement because everyone is familiar with a Google Doc. Everyone has created text or a blog or whatever it may be. And so this is a great way to learn how to edit. Descript also has nonlinear editing, which is basically just how any editing platform works. So you can use it as a natural and normal editor, but it just gives you that option to be able to edit the text. So it's a really unique platform that we like to talk about. Now, jumping up, we have Soapbox by Wistia, you have Vidyard, and you have Loom. These are all free platforms you can utilize, and they offer very basic editing services, right? So you can trim your edges, you can make little micro adjustments, but you can't really go above and beyond that. It just gives you those basic editing tools, trimming it up, maybe dropping even one of their like 10 free music tracks down on it, and then exporting it. That's basically your nine yards. This is perfect for sending out quick sales uh, videos, right? So let's say you call someone, they don't pick up the phone. This is a perfect opportunity to then send them a follow-up email with a video you can record and edit within Soapbox very quickly and send it out, right? So that's kind of your surface level editors. Then we move into iMovie and Windows Movie Maker. That's kind of your next step. It's not a huge step. Um, it gives you a little bit more plugins and features that you can use. You can even do a little bit of color correcting and whatnot in these platforms, but it does give you kind of that full feature editing application. You can go in, you can edit your videos, you can add everything you want, uh, and you can export the video. So that's all good. What we Luca use, had a, a question yeah. here. I responded in the chat, but I just want to make sure to go over it. Descript does have a number of different uh, languages now, in addition to just English. Uh, it's like over 30 languages, I think, or something like that. It's a, it's a pretty large number. I believe so. And actually, Descript is really good with customer service. So since we're doing Descript in the boot camp, they're pretty reactive to us. And so um, we had a, an attendee in the boot camp, um, and they were from India, and they asked if their language was supported. It wasn't at the time. We sent Descript an email asking if it would be supported, and they followed up and actually brought that support within a couple of weeks. So they are excellent. They Yeah, Corey there in the chat just dropped they have 22 different languages you can utilize. So um, it is very universal in that sense. All right, I'm going to go back and, and step back to the editors here. Um, we were talking about Adobe Premiere and Apple Final Cut Pro. That's kind of where we get into at Nextiny, the editors we utilize. Um, I use Adobe Premiere personally because it just works across the board with all the Adobe products, right? So I'm editing all my videos. I'm able to utilize plugins that we've purchased as well as free plugins. They have some unique transitions that you can utilize. And like I said, they work across the board with other applications. So I just saw in the chat, someone said, I use After Effects. That's more of a graphic creation program where you can create you know, 3D renderings, you can create 2D graphics, whatever it may be. And then it seamlessly trans transitions into Adobe Premiere because they're all Adobe products. So that's what I use on a personal note. Um, Corey actually uses DaVinci Resolve. He is a certified DaVinci Resolve trainer, I believe, Corey. Is that correct? Man, yeah. I'm a yeah. Resolve certified instructor and I am an Avid Media Composer certified user. 
There you uh, go. So who's who's yeah. better to talk about this stuff than Corey? I'll go ahead and let him just kind of discuss those editors. Sure. Yeah, they um, these are a little bit I, I don't want to say necessarily they're more high end. I say they came from more kind of a legacy background that certainly was a lot higher end. Um, but Media Composer and Resolve are very similar kind of tier level to Premiere these days. Um, Media Composer has a lot more kind of networked features to it. So this works really well for people on television shows and things like that, where you've got an editor in LA and they're shooting in New York and your colorist is in Montana. All of them can be working off of the same unified system. So that works really well with Media Composer. Um, and that's kind of its primary purpose for that. Um, it does a wonderful job of just general editing, um, but it is also a little bit more particular in terms of its settings and its setup. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely like Matt just said, it's very confusing. It's, um, it's a little too much for most people because it's looking for more of that kind of, more of a workflow involved as opposed to just a quick, easy editor. Um, da Vinci Resolve, this kind of comes from the, you know, the, the legacy version of, of Da Vinci, which was a hardware-based console for color grading. Um, they, it, it was purchased by Blackmagic Design, you know, over 10 years ago or something now, uh, and they released it as actually a free program. There is a studio, like, upgraded edition that has some additional features and things, um, but what used to be like a $30,000 hardware console is now the entry level is free. Um, I really like it because you can start learning on something and then as you start to be like, ooh, it would be really cool if, you know, I could track their face and add a beauty mask or, you know, some kind of more high-end feature or like, ooh, somebody left a Starbucks cup in the background. Let me just track it and automatically remove it. Um, you can do all that stuff with the studio version of Resolve. So it's a little bit more full-featured, um, kind of in the way that Premiere and Adobe has built an ecosystem. Resolve has, uh, they've purchased Fusion, so there's a node-based compositing engine inside of it, as well as Fairlight, which is a full audio editing suite that also used to be its own console-based uh, system. So they've really kind of done their best to purchase a few like really kind of high-end, you know, cinema-level companies and deliver them to people for free, uh, which is pretty amazing. And it is you know, it is maybe a little bit kind of uh, a, a, a bit more intimidating than getting into, for example, like an iMovie or a movie maker. Um, but if you can get Adobe Premiere, you can also figure out Resolve. And like I said, it's free, which is great. Um, so it's a really good option for if you just have a couple projects you need to put out, you don't want to sign up for a subscription or, you know, purchase Final Cut Pro for, I think it's like two or $300. Um, resolve that free version is great for, let me just download it real quick, chop this apart and be done with it. It's, it's a really great tool for that. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you say you can, uh, like rotoscope, a Starbucks cup out. I'm trying to figure out why game of Thrones didn't use, uh, DaVinci Resolve to edit. I don't there. know. It's, uh, it'll track it and everything. It's, it's uses, uh, the, the most recent versions all have neural engines built into it. So it's literally like you put a box on it, you click view, analyze scene, and then you hit replace and you can feather it and adjust it if you need to. But like, I've literally taken a water bottle out, off of a, a shelf before in a project and just it was one click, it was easy. Well, there you go, HBO. If, if you aren't paying attention, definitely chime into our uh, hug here because we have all the, the keys awesome. to remove that, that Starbucks cup at the back. If, if no one knows what I'm talking about, there was a Starbucks cup in the final, uh, final couple episodes of the Game of Thrones. So it was really funny. All right. Um, uh, Camilla is asking, are we gonna send the slides? Yes, we are gonna send all of this. So we're gonna have a post wrap up uh, email and it's going to have all the slides. And then we're also gonna link to the recording which we upload to YouTube as well. All right, so moving on here, let's talk a little bit about branding, right? Cause this is big to the editing scene. Branding is so important to not only your video, but just to your brand as a whole, right? In a, in a nutshell, we're trying to create videos to really bring brand emphasis and brand affinity to ourselves, right? So that's what we're doing at Nexity Marketing. And we do that through long format series where we're creating these weekly series um, and we're putting it out on a consistent basis. And so people need to know what that is, right? Everyone needs to know you have a show. So implementing all of this branding is really important. The screenshot we have here is from uh, one of our series called MarTech Masters, where we go and we interview a number of 
uh, just people in the industry, in the MarTech industry that have their different companies and CEOs and whatnot. Um, and they just speak to whatever MarTech that they're involved in. But of course, branding is so important. So you can see from the screenshots we have up in the right corner, we call it a little bug. And so it's basically just half opacity, our logo there. Then of course we have, you can see Gabriel's shot, he has his lower third. So his, his name, as well as his title and our logo at next to me. Then we, we created the MarTech Masters branding. So it's MTM, we have the color scheme, the whole nine yards. So we implement it into our thumbnails. We implement it as questions are being asked and the person is speaking to, you know, maybe a longer format question. We make sure that we have the question just displayed on the screen there. That way, you know, if someone kind of pops in or they skip around in the video, they can kind of get a general sense of what they're speaking to. But branding is so important, right? Just making sure that your your all of your videos are very um, like it just provides a lot of cohesion to everything. So we really, really recommend making sure that you're branding all your videos in the correct manner, you know, adding a quick introduction, a quick outro animation, like a logo, colors, bug, watermark, you know, you see it up top there. Just making sure that you're branded as much as possible. That way, when people are digesting your content, they're connecting that brand to the content. So they're going, but this is really great content. This is the series that I'm watching. I'm going to keep coming back to the series because I'm really enjoying what I'm watching, right? So it's just connecting the dots to everything to make sure that your audience is paying attention and staying your audience as well. Uh, Corey, you have anything to add there on branding? No, I mean, I the one thing I guess I would add is that um, utilize the tools in your software to make this a little bit easier on yourself, right? You can save, you know, certain templates or you can make these in programs and just make sure you save the files as easy as possible so that all you have to do is swap out logos, swap out names. Like there's no use in literally having to redo all of this stuff constantly. Mm -hmm. um, utilizing templates and saving effects will really save you a whole lot of time. So for things like branded shows like this, you do it once and then the next episode becomes so much quicker. You're just kind of dropping in footage, swapping out names, and you're ready to go. It's a lot um, more of an investment at the beginning, kind of setting everything up, but then it saves you a whole lot of time down the line. Absolutely. That's a good point. All right. So moving to the next slide here, we'll talk a little bit about color correction versus color grading. And I guess before I really hop into it, anyone in the chat want to let us know, do you know the difference between color correction versus color grading? Like I said, let us know there in the chat. Um, and I guess while I'm asking that question, I'll speak to what you're looking at on screen here. So this is the uh, coloring screen of Adobe Premiere. So you can see on my left-hand side, I have my Lumetri scopes. That's basically showing me you know, the contrast of the actual frame. It's showing me the colors of the frame, what colors are popping out more than others. And so what I'm trying to do is try to kind of expand that scope a little bit, you know, kind of touching the very top just ever so slightly and touching the bottom. So you're kind of hitting the full spectrum of contrast as well as colors, but you're not going overboard. You're not, you know, pushing it to its limitations. Then of course you have just the viewer there right in the middle. And then on your right-hand side, you have all of your different toggle sliders. So I can, I can change my color temperature, I can change the tint, you know, exposure, contrast, so on and so forth to really just adjust my frame to my liking. All right, I see Oscar's color. Oscar says, correcting is more fixing mistakes and balancing the image, whereas grading is at an artistic look. That is exactly correct, right? Color correction is just making sure that my frame and my video is exactly to the right exposure, the right contrast, so on and so forth. Once I am color corrected, then you apply your specific color grade. Of course, you don't have to do that, but a lot of people will go out and they have their preset color grades that they really like. You know, everyone has a personal preference. Some people kind of like that more cinematic grainy look. Some people more like that more contrasty, saturated look. And of course, it really goes to what video you're kind of creating, right? It depends on your client, the mood of the video, and that goes a lot into color grading. But again, it's, there's no right or wrong to color grading. It's really more just personal preference and how you go about, you know, wanting your reds to pop more or your blues to pop more, your yellows to be toned down a little bit. So I'm going to go through just a, a couple slides here. You can see color correction and color grading. So the first one, overall, the, the frame on the left, it's correctly exposed. We're not too bright. We're not too low. But it's just adding a little bit of contrast, a little bit of saturation to the overall image because we were doing this video for a mini golf course. So it's basically just an overview 
of the mini golf course. So we want, you know, people to be more uh, uplifting, a little bit happier, smiling, laughing. So we want to bring a little bit more contrast and a little bit more saturation to it because it's more exciting of a video. You can see here's another screenshot. This is color correcting. So the left frame, this, the shadows are just a little too dark, right? So I'm just trying to basically correct my exposure on the right side so you can see there, you know, the shadows aren't too dark. We're making sure that the lady and the gentleman are properly exposed. And then from there on my right side, then I can go into my color grading. Yeah, Lynn Lee says, like they say, you can buy my Lux. Don't worry, we're not, guys, we're not gonna sell you any uh, lots here. So don't worry. Um, Corey, Corey might have some good recommendations. And they all make everything green. <laughs> there you go. Corey might have some good recommendations on LUTs, but I'm definitely not selling you anything. So the only ones that I really use, and, and it's not something that I'm trying to sell. I don't make money off them any or anything, but the, the only pack of them that I found that are very flexible, there is a subscription service called Ludify.me. Um, I subscribe to them for a number of years and they give a bunch more updates and packages and stuff. They're really flexible and they have a ton of it. It's more of like looks based on feelings or skin tones and things like that. Um, and they're a lot more subtle. Most people tend to have really bad ones when they're just kind of like influencer packs. Like you're like, you don't use this for your own footage because your stuff looks nothing like this. So uh, Letify.me is, is a, a good brand. I could vouch for their, their quality. Um, like I said, I, I don't get paid by them or anything, but I do use them for stuff. There you go. Nice little input there. Um, all right. So hopping over to video hosting platforms, talking about a little bit about where you should put your videos, right? So, you know, everyone is, is just wondering what advantages do I get by hosting on different platforms, right? And so first one we'll talk about is YouTube and YouTube is beneficial in all ways, shapes and forms to upload your videos and keep them there as kind of a library and archive of all of your videos, right? YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So people are always searching on there. So you're not, you know, you're not doing yourself justice if you don't put your videos on YouTube. Just having that library there is very beneficial. Now, we like to make sure that we're putting our videos not only on YouTube, but we utilize Wistia. So Wistia is a platform that, of course, it's a paid platform. We get a little bit better analytics. Um, the codec is a little bit better. So the quality when we upload it is just going to be a little bit higher overall. But the biggest thing is we have customizable player and we're able to embed in our website, right? So that way, when people are watching a video on our website, they aren't relinking or redirecting out of our website back to YouTube. That's the biggest thing about YouTube, right? If you embed a video on YouTube, they might watch it there. But if they click the little YouTube button, it's going to relink them. And now they're living on YouTube, right? They're, they're collecting that view on YouTube rather than spending time on your site, which is what we're trying to accomplish. So with Wistia, we're able to embed everything within our website, keep everybody in our website, right? We can even create what's called a channel, which is basically a, a frame IO that embeds directly on your website. And it creates like this Netflix like experience where people can basically watch your series. So we have multiple series and people can watch episode one. As soon as episode one finishes, they move on to episode two. So it's a very good structure. And again, it is keeping people on your site and building that performance. You have a few other hosting platforms I always like to make sure I mention. Of course, Vidyard is very similar to Wistia. I do know that they had uh, an implementation directly with HubSpot that has since kind of uh, faded a little bit. So Wistia and Vidyard are kind of along the same lines there. I know more salespeople do utilize Vidyard, um, and, but they give relatively the same exact analytics. You know, there's nothing crazy above and beyond that you're going to find one and not find in the other. And then I want to talk about Vimeo as well. Vimeo is more for artists, right? You know, your codecs, when you upload to Vimeo, their compression rates are a lot better than most other hosting platforms. So you're looking at if you're really honed in on your color spacing, you know, and the finite details of all your videos, Vimeo might be a good option to explore when uploading there. But I do want to talk about the analytics on Vimeo. They are not as robust and as detailed as Wistia or Vidyard. So if you're really looking for more of that marketing metric and really figuring out how my analytics can better our company as a whole, you know, you would really want to explore Wistia or Vidyard in that sense. All right, Corey, you have anything to add there before I move on to the hosting? 
Yeah, just that, I mean, YouTube is part of Google, right? So it's part of like the largest search engine of content as well. So it does help to always kind of cross post. Like it's very helpful to still put things on YouTube. People often go youtube.com, let me search this thing. And then you can kind of drive them back to your website. Um, just know that, you know, it like, like Aaron was saying, those embedded view counts don't matter from YouTube. So that's why we want to make sure we have Wistia so that on our website, when people are watching them, we're getting these metrics, we're getting the analytics so that we can figure out what works and what doesn't work, right? YouTube doesn't really offer you that same level of kind of granularity or detail. Um, and they certainly don't give you anything in embedded videos. So uh, it's very important to kind of utilize the right software in the right place, knowing that um, you know, you're probably going to put it on YouTube. You're probably maybe going to put it to Twitter or LinkedIn, like, or Instagram, for example, like just think of it as another platform, another social network that you have your content living on. Um, but really if for, for those really high level, important pieces, put them all on your website, get them on a Wistia or a Vidyard, something that's embedded and getting you more data. Absolutely. All right, so we'll move on to some video analytics, right? So we talked about the editing platforms, the hosting platforms, how to do a little bit of basic editing, right? You know, if, if anyone's here and they're looking how to learn how to do some video editing, of course, you guys can reach out to us. We're not gonna go into the finite details of how to cut everything up, but um, shifting over to some video analytics, let's talk about the first one here, view count. So Corey was just talking about this, right? If you're on YouTube and you're stacking that view count, that is going against your website and you're, it's not counting towards anything there. So view count is really just overall the number of times a video has been watched. Um, this is really a good indication though of the reach of your content, right? How many people's, how many sets of eyeballs are just viewing your video? And this is really bringing from various platforms, right? Various platforms measure this completely differently. So some platforms measure it after five seconds of playing, it counts a view count. Another platform might measure after 30 seconds of the video. So there's really just make sure that you're taking that grain of salt in consideration when measuring the view counts on each platform. Now, I want to talk about just kind of things that you want to do um, to boost your view count or things you want to avoid to, to when, when it comes to view count, right? Um, the first thing is just sharing your video through the audience, through social media and communication channels like email, right? So if your video is relevant on a specific channel, make sure you're posting it there, um, sending it out to maybe some, some people via email, whatever it may be. Also sharing it with relevant influencers, right? So if your product or service kind of aligns with someone who has a, a big following, if they benefit from potentially sharing or utilizing your service, make sure you're sharing it with them so they can kind of pick it up and to potentially share it to their audience. And then of course you have pay to promote as well, right? PPC, uh, Facebook ads, things like that. You know, sharing your videos through those channels if you need to be uh, making sure where your audience is found. The biggest thing though with view count, right? Is it's, it's very surface level. So it's not extremely important. Of course, we want as many views as possible, but we also don't wanna just boost our view count to the moon if the right eyeballs aren't actually watching the video. So don't spam your videos into a bunch of random channels where it's not really relevant, right? Take a measured approach and then post your video in the specific channels that you should be doing. And then of course, don't post your video in unrelated channels. Don't also spam your play. Um, I know so many people that have started their YouTube channel and they're like, well, if I just refresh my page every minute, it just counts another view count. And yeah, it might do that for a while until your IP gets flagged, by YouTube and then they just stop counting any view count from your IP address. So definitely do not spam the play button or, uh, on your YouTube videos to boost your view count because you will get flagged and eventually it'll stop working. And what they'll do is they'll also blacklist you and they'll just stop showing your videos in the recommended channels on the right hand side. So definitely avoid that when it comes to YouTube. Second metric I wanna talk about is play rate. And this is a little more important than that view count, right? So this is really just the amount of visitors who came to that web page and then clicked play and actually started watching the video versus the people who loaded that web page, saw the video and actually did not click play. So this really just provides some good context in the sense of where your video is placed on the page, right? So if it's front and center at the top, you will see your play rate higher than if it was placed on the bottom in the corner, of course. Um, and so 
things that you want to do to kind of just boost that play rate, right? This is really important, making sure that the most eyeballs that who are loading that web page are viewing it, uh, increasing the size of your video embed, uh, like I just said, changing the location of your video to be a little bit more front and center, uh, making sure that your copy is complementing the video, right? That's super important, right? Because if you place a video that's not necessarily relevant to the blog that someone's reading, and they see a video and go, oh, cool, I'm gonna watch that video. I bet it's related to this blog. It's on the same web page. They click play and it's an about us video. They're probably gonna click out of it. So it's not necessarily relevant, but making sure that just complementary um, content to the video. And then maybe just exploring the option of moving a video to a more relevant page or a page with just higher traffic overall. Um, so those are things that you definitely want to look into when it comes to play rate and how you can kind of bump that up to make sure you're taking advantage of making everyone clicking play when loading that web page. Uh, I'm seeing some questions here. Uh, would you say unique viewers is a better metric than total view count for reach? Um, yeah, absolutely. Unique viewers, you know, the more num different people are watching your video is more beneficial than one person watching a bunch of video. Now, I will go over a case study about a little bit later here about one person who watched a lot of video and then of course converted into a customer. That's important as well. But I think more of the just a broad expanding number of unique viewers is a lot more important than the same people kind of just continuously watching that video and digesting that same content. All right, so moving over to the third metric, one that I really enjoy and I really look at when measuring everything is going to be engagement. So engagement is really just showing how much of the video that visitor watched, right? And so you have engagement, which is specific to that specific visitor. And then you have average engagement, which is the average time that everyone that has watched that video watched it. And you can see there, the, the little graph there on the left-hand side, we have our average engagement. You can see the blue line versus the orange line. The orange is that specific viewer and the blue is all of the views uh, and the average engagement there. This is so important because you can really hone in on specific areas of your video where people are dropping off. So if you have a really big dip, you know, you can see right off the bat, there's always a dip right at the beginning because you always have a number of people who click the play button and then immediately they didn't mean to. So they just leave the video or they leave that web page. That's very natural to see that big dip at the beginning but then it kind of steadies off and it levels down. That's of course natural as well. People will watch 30 seconds and exit. People will watch 40 seconds and exit. That just happens, right? But this is really, really good because again, like I was saying, if there's a big dip, let's say at 45 seconds, go revisit that video and understand why it's dipping right there. You know, maybe there was a glitch in the video where it goes black for five seconds, right? And so someone, everyone that's viewing it is seeing this point and then dropping off there because they're thinking, oh, the video just kind of broke or whatever. So I'm going to leave. Understand all of and pinpoint all of those locations that people are dropping off. Maybe it's too long format of a video and people are just getting bored and leaving at a certain point. Maybe your guest speaker just started rambling off of something and they're, they just went in a complete tangent and they're not speaking to the relevant media. So again, there's a lot of different reasons, but engagement is a great opportunity to really look at it and go, where are people dropping off and why are people dropping off? Why, how can we make this video better? All right. So the fourth one I want to talk about is click-through rate. And click-through rate is really just pertaining to what's called call to actions in your video. The next step, this is people taking the next step after you're viewing your video, right? So um, things you really wanna make sure you're doing in your videos is adding annotation links. So that way, if, you're, if it's a three minute video and you're talking to a product or service and someone has watched a minute of that video and they've decided right now, I wanna get this. You know, I've, I made my decision. Make sure you're adding annotation links that they can click and go straight to that, you know, to, to purchase maybe, right? Um, making sure that people are just going through the funnel with your call to actions. Also make sure that at the end, it's, uh, it kind of takes them to the next step, right? So what we do is in our email signatures, we'll have kind of a follow-up call to action where you can actually schedule a meeting with us if you want to do that. So we talk about who we are, what we do as, as a job. And if you want to speak to us,
please let us know. The video ends, boom, right into schedule a meeting with us. So it's very much friendly in that sense of inviting someone to take that next step. Now, things you wanna kinda of do to boost your click-through rate is making sure they're kinda of rotating your call to action, right? And then changing the place if it's not effective. If you're seeing that your, your click-through rate is only 4% and your engagement you know, is only at like 10% at the end, you're only seeing like 10% of the total viewers actually getting to the end, maybe you, you change your call to action at the end to an annotation link in the middle. So you have more people kind of clicking on it before they drop off in the video, right? Also, don't let your annotation links and your call to actions become 404. This has happened to so many people and this is actually, admittedly has happened to us too, right? Um, we have a guest speaker on our weekly series. We link back to his blog. Next thing you know, he deletes that blog. And so that annotation link is 404. Just making sure that all your annotation links, your call to actions are always staying up to date and live. So that way when people take that next step, they don't hit a wall. And then um, just things that you, uh, or I guess the last thing you wanna make sure you're doing is it's just staying extremely relevant to your content too. You don't wanna you know, have an about us where you're talking about you know, general, very surface level stuff. And then you go into schedule a meeting with us, right? It's, it just doesn't really connect e the dots there. So you wanna just make sure that your, your call to action is just highly relevant to the content of your video. All right, so this is the fun one, um, conversion rate, right? This is the one that everyone really, really wants to hone in on and they wanna show their boss or, or their higher ups, like, look, our conversion rate with video is super high and everything's beautiful. It's really difficult, of course, to pinpoint and hone in on converting a customer with video, right? But what is conversion rate? Conversion rate is just the number of leads or customers that you have thanks to a piece of video content. Now, what we do is we try to measure conversion rate by people who have watched that video and then taken the next step, right? You can never just go, hey, this person watched this video and they purchased because they watched this video. We don't know all of that information unless we actually speak to them directly, right? But of course, maybe they viewed three different blogs and then they viewed you know, an About Us page, then they watched a video, then they converted to a customer. We can attribute video being part of that success, but we can't attribute it to everything, right? So that's where we're trying to connect different softwares, like we have our HubSpot CRM connect, connected to Wistia, and we're basically taking the analytics and we're pulling the hotspots and the IPs of people who have watched video and those same IPs who converted into customers and trying to relate and correlate how much time did they watch on video and they converted to a customer. Maybe now we can reach out to them and ask them how much was video part of their experience, right? So this is all just the, a bigger picture kind of thing. Conversion rate, you can't just hone in and say, yeah, he watched that video 75%, he clicked the, the next step and then he purchased a home, boom video was successful because you never know maybe he read a blog before that and he accidentally just clicked on the video and it attributed to it but it actually didn't count right so conversion rate is a little bit more loaded in that sense um but you still can measure it with the right tools implemented and connected all right and then the last one i want to talk about is going to be feedback which is more of that human aspect right feedback isn't necessarily so much of a number that we're looking at but it is going to be just the reaction of people responding to your video, right? So maybe you went off, went some sort of direction that you didn't realize or something's wrong in your video. Everyone will let you know in the comment section, right? This is where people are going out of their way to let you know what's going on. So definitely take feedback um, you know, with value, but you also have to take feedback with a grain of salt, right? Because it's, it's a double-edged sword. You have a lot of people that will give you valuable feedback and very clear feedback. You'll also get a lot of people just kind of saying whatever they want, right? You also have a lot of spam filters that pop in here. So it's a little bit of a grain of salt when taking feedback, but definitely listen to your target audience, understand what they have to say. Yeah, I see Matt just popped in the chat. Constructive criticism should be viewed as a positive. Absolutely, right? We're always trying to get our videos better and just be more valuable in content. So overall, take that feedback and understand what people want to view and then just kind of hone in and make those videos better for your, your uh, target audience. 
Okay, I need to take a take a sip here. I feel like I've been talking a bit. Corey, you have anything to add on analytics before I jump into the tools? Um, no, I mean, I, I do think, you know, constructive criticism, as, as Matt mentioned, that is the way to improve. I mean, certainly that is the reason that we put feedback on videos. Um, the one thing I will say is because Facebook isn't really moderated super heavily, um, you know, it may turn out that you put comments on and you find out that you have to turn them off. Maybe a certain guest that you have is, um, controversial or something for some reason. And, it just turns out that you're getting flooded with hate comments or something like that. And it's, it can be easier to turn it off when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, YouTube doesn't have as much of a filter as other platforms do. So just something to consider. Yeah. Um, certainly you, you hope for uh, the best, you hope for constructive criticism and, right. and just kind of general feedback and engagement with the community. Um, that is certainly ideal for sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm hopping over to some tools, right? So we're gonna talk about the tools that we measure the success of our videos. And so our choice for video optimization analytics is the connection between these three different programs we use, right? HubSpot, Databox, and Wistia. We're kind of just connecting the dots everywhere with these different platforms to tell the bigger picture of how we can measure and track the success of videos. Now, you just kind of saw this, it's screenshot of Wistia Analytics. Obviously you have average engagement, your plays, your play rate, so on and so forth. But really just, of course, you can read your heat maps, you can find those opportunities. Um, everything written here is just things we've covered, right? Cropping your videos in the editing phase, adding the call to actions over with your click-through rates and whatnot. But I wanna talk a little bit about the heat map section of Wistia and how we utilize it, right? Because this is, a case study that we did. And we need to hone in and understand how videos affecting those leads and then closing into the customer. This is, like I just said, a case study. And it was a customer who watched, what is it, uh, 45 minutes of video before they converted to a customer, right? So as I was just mentioning, we can attribute video being part of their success. But in this general sense, he watched so much more video than visited any other pages. And when you spend 45 minutes watching 14 different videos, their average engagement was 99.9%. .9%. And they went through a phase where it was four months of this, right? So four months of watching 14 different videos. And we really understood that this person was clearly watching the videos and getting the sense because it's from several different viewpoints. So he was obviously traveling to different locations. We can hone in and say video was part of this success in closing this this client right so again going back to the whole conversion rate we might not necessarily say this customer closed because of video but it definitely attributed to that closure so this is how we measure that success right moving on here just video optimization uh, this is another case study that we did so video optimization actually by reducing quality which sounds a little bit crazy but i want to talk about how we so one of our clients uh they were basically uh like an airbnb style company right they have all of these larger mansion homes and it's actually all around disney world so they host homes where people are coming into disney world and they're staying in their homes what they do is uh, they had this really fancy sparkly pay video on their homepage, you watch it, it's about a minute of fluff. I mean, there's sun flare shots, there's slow-mo shots, it's really beautiful. It tells no story. It literally had no messaging in it at all. They hired a production company to do it, and it was a, a gorgeous video. But again, no actual context to what's going on. So when they hired us for our marketing services, we when we started doing video, we actually um, this even predates me, but when Nextony went out to record these videos, we did it with an iPhone. It was a very, very simple learning curve. Um, you know, uh, Megan, our creative director now, she went out with a little gimbal and a little iPhone and she recorded a video that was extremely intentional, right? We showed off the homes, we showed off the living rooms, the kitchen, we showed off the amenities, we showed off everything that all of these homes are offering and what you're going to get when you stay in this home. Well, the video quality obviously it significantly dropped. We went from a whole production crew and lights and you know several people with their hands in the pot to Megan with the iPhone. But guess what worked? It was the iPhone video because people actually understood what they're getting and what they're, you know, what they're bringing to. 
So we increased the video conversion rate by 25 times, but then we also doubled the average view engagement. So people were clicking play on that really pretty video. And then maybe halfway through the video, they realized like, this is giving me absolutely nothing where they watch the iPhone video and they go, this is a walkthrough of the home I'm going to be staying in next week. So it's just a lot more valuable to that person. And we also have a case study. I don't know if you have the link or not, Corey, but um, we're happy to share. We have a whole blog on this that we can find and share this. If you're interested in reading kind of how we did this on a step-by-step -step basis, you're more than welcome to read that. Again, just measuring video success with HubSpot. We're basically connecting the links, the CRM, to HubSpot, to Wistia, and then Wistia to Databox to create these reports. And then here's that same report on Databox. So I was just speaking to the two different videos. We were able to see that with the old video, they were closing at a 7%. I jumped to 20% when people were watching that video. So you can just see the biggest jump overall. People want to digest content. They want to understand what they, like they're clicking play to watch something, not to just watch a bunch of fluff. So always understand what the content is, what your target, target audience is and why they're there and what they're looking for and then creating the video of that nature. So that is the reporting aspect of it all. Um, there was a very abrupt ending here, but here we are. We just came to the, the conclusion of the presentation. So we are gonna open it up for Q&A. I believe we have about eight minutes left or so. So Corey and I will be hanging out here to just kind of hanging out, yeah. All right, Luca says, sorry guys, I have to leave. Thanks a lot, ciao. No problem. Thanks for coming, Luca. We appreciate your attendance. All right. Luca, so Diane- Good one. Thoughts on animated videos. Oh yeah. So we actually are doing a lot of animated videos, Diane. Um, since the pandemic, right? Of course, it's been what, three years now, roughly. Um, we really dove into animated videos when the pandemic hit, of course. With video production kind of coming to a halt, Corey and I not being able to go out and actually record anyone in person, we really took animated to the next level where we try to understand uh, a business as a whole. What kind of video are they trying to create? Isn't it about us video? Can they record it in the comfort of their home, right? Can we set them up and provide them with enough information to where they can actually get a camera set up and everything and record it themselves? But the biggest thing is how can we complement full screen graphics to what they're speaking to, right? So we started utilizing software uh, or an application called Biteable. It's very surface level. It's very easy animation stuff. Um, and they provide all of these presets to where we can go in and, you know, our bank is a client. We can pull all the animated things with money and banks and, you know, whatever it may be. They have a whole archive of animated footage that you can utilize and customize to kind of fit your needs, right? So animated is definitely kind of taking off in, in our world. Corey, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of, I guess to, to expand on it, certainly it, it's a lot easier of an entryway to get customers because you don't have to physically be in the same environment as them, uh, which is great. And it's been made so easy these days that like, like Aaron said, Biteable, I know there's, uh, you know, a ton of other software that are like this that are pretty much like, you know, um, Canva level, drop everything together, kind of edit the text, and you've got a really decent looking animation um, that's very professional. And it can be a little bit better than maybe say just, um, you know, a, a lower quality webcam recording or something. Um, but it does, there is certainly uh, an advantage to having a human element in videos. A lot of times if we do do like a heavily animated uh, piece, it can help to have a little bit of an intro even by a person on camera just saying like, hey, this is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm the CEO or like, welcome to this, to our webpage, you know, just some kind of smiling face, a happy person kind of welcomes people. Um, it makes it feel a little bit more personal. That's one of the things that's kind of lost with animation is that you lose the kind of human touch of it. Um, so it's, you know, pluses and minuses. Certainly it's a tool to be leveraged and for things like, you know, our social posts and stuff, that's awesome to be able to kind of template that stuff out. But uh, human connection is certainly important and it's something that, you know, you should consider for sure in, in all of your videos. Absolutely. A couple other questions here. Um... 
You guys mentioned other hugs you did about pre-production and production. Yeah, I did attend these, but will you do them again? Or if not, can you share the recording? Absolutely. Everything is up, uh, Corey, correct me if I'm wrong, on our YouTube, right? Uh, actually, if you go to the uh, event page, which I'm about to share right now, our HubSpot event page, uh, this has all of our not only upcoming events, if you'd like to register for any of them, uh, but you can also see the completed events. If you click on any of those past events, there's a big button, bold font there that says, watch this event's recording here, and it'll open it up on our site. and You can view it there. Awesome. And then let's see, Oscar asks, what is Databox? What's the advantage versus Wistia Analytics? So Databox actually isn't giving you any sort of analytics like Wistia does. Databox is more of like a reporting application where you can put your analytics in it, let it digest all that information, and then you can make calculations and make certain different changes to spit out a report to be able to show people. So that's how we report back to Gabriel, our CEO, when, when showing off the analytics of a video. Um, let's see, speaking of animation, have you used Adobe Character Animator at all? I have specifically, yeah, a little bit. Um, I haven't dove too deep into it, but it does seem like a really fun tool to be able to utilize. Um, yeah, Corey, you have anything to add on it? Um, yeah, I mean, we've we've kind of touched on it a, a, a little bit. Like, I, I've kind of dipped my toes into it. Um, yeah. It's super easy. Uh, they, I know they've done a number of, like, I think they've even done, like, a Simpsons episode using it or something where they animated it in real time just to do it, uh, which is pretty cool. It saves a lot of work. It It is a lot of setup, right? So you've got to find a puppet. You've got to figure out if you're making your own one. There's, like, a certain number of mouth movements you have to program and things like that. So there's setup involved in it, sure, but once you get that kind of stuff done, um, it's pretty awesome that you just kind of hit record, say your speech, read your dialogue, and you'll see your little puppet moving right along with yeah. your mouth. Um, so it looks very professional. Um, there is a bit of a higher learning curve for sure. It's it's definitely more than something like, you know, biteable or something. And there are even just like animated ones that just have like the mouths moving. So you just kind of put your voice over it. It's not going to line up perfectly like character animator would, but like you can kind of hack it a little bit and kind of get away with stuff like that. Um, character animator is certainly like, if you want to do a series or, you know, you're, you're trying to do some kind of, um, you know, long-term effort with this, certainly character animator is great because you can basically make, you know, the host of your series as a character and then they can kind of reappear in multiple videos for that purpose. But like, like I said, it's, it's a bit more work for a one-off video. So you kind of want to tailor that more towards serial content. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions beyond that. Just a lot of people saying thank you. So thank you guys for attending. We appreciate it. I think this is a good time to wrap it up now. If you guys do have any other questions, of course, the HubSpot video study group is there to ask questions 24 seven. So definitely pop in there. If you do have questions in the future, we'll definitely answer it. So. Uh, do you guys have any YouTube spe YouTube specific hugs? Nothing, nothing on the extent of YouTube, right? We kind of just talk about YouTube in the the video hosting section, um, so we haven't really gone in full detail of it. You could always join into our next office hours if you would like. Um, that is going to be on November the seventeenth. Uh, feel free to hop in. That we do a little bit more kind of Q and A sessions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, I see I have it on my calendar. Um, certainly go ahead and ask us any kind of questions, get that prepared. That's exactly what Office Hours is for. And we can kind of tailor that a little bit more towards uh, information that you might be looking for. Yeah, absolutely. We'll conduct it more of that like AMA style. So, mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. It's 2.30. We'll, I'll see you all in the next event. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.